why don't we introduce it? So we have a really, really interesting group of people here from uh, accounting, technology, startups, uh, private funds. So I think it should be a really interesting discussion. Why don't you just take some time to introduce? Go ahead. Sure. So I'm Robert Matarazzi, the CEO of Luca. And at Luca, we're solving data problems for businesses interacting with digital assets. Um, and we do that with uh, SaaS software that's managing data with our um, direct data products, market data, and, and uh, qualitative data. And then we've recently acquired a company called CoinFirm, which um, adds capabilities in AML and compliance. Hi, I'm uh, Robert Haddock. So I'm a general partner at a fund called Dragonfly Capital. We're about a $2.5 billion uh, crypto-only venture fund. Uh, we also have a long-only uh, strategy as well. Been around since 2017, invest across pretty much every vertical and niche within the space. Uh, and we also invest um, globally. So a big part of our fund is and our investment team is uh, in Asia, as well as here in the US. My name is Vincent Molino. I'm the head of operations due diligence at Bitwise Asset Management. Just a quick uh, background on our firm. So Bitwise is one of the original crypto asset managers. Uh, we've been around since 2017. Right now we manage about uh, six and $700 million. Um, I'm responsible for our hedge fund product. Uh, conducting due diligence on underlying crypto investment managers. Hi, everyone. I'm Rabia Iqbal. I am the managing partner and co-founder of a fund called Neural Capital. Neural Capital is a fund of funds in the venture crypto space. We have allocated to 10 venture crypto funds, and uh, we have also done a few direct investments as well. Uh, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is uh, doing both the investment due diligence and the operational due diligence for a very nascent asset class. Uh, prior to uh, founding Neural Capital, I was doing this work at the Abu Dhabi Sovereign Wealth Fund. Thank you. And I should mention that I'm from Consensus. Uh, I, Consensus is a Ethereum focused company. I lead the treasury operations and treasury management. And um, Really, really happy to have you around, and uh, let's let's just jump into the uh, discussion here. Um, we have several topics that we would like to address today. Uh, they range from uh, institutional trends to new sort of technological trends that we're seeing in the space. So let's uh, let's start with some of the institutional trends and how people are thinking about the space right now, given what we have seen last couple of years, um, and uh, what are the things that we are seeing improving on the due diligence side. What are the things that the institutional investor is looking for, and how they are thinking about the space in general, given given the uh, serious issues we faced last couple of years, in particularly with the due diligence. I'm happy to jump yeah. in here. Uh, so we touched on this a little bit yesterday, uh, where there there is a little bit of a fatigue right now for private funds. Um, uh, there was there was a discussion yesterday with the allocators where uh, people are, you know, weighting more emphasis on liquid strategies right now. I think that you can see that in crypto as well. Um, generally, fatigue with the venture strategies. People are very very concerned with longer lockup periods. Like the typical venture fund is ten years plus two, and then plus another two years, uh, that is causing a lot of people in this high interest rate environment, a lot of pause when making commitments. Uh, one thing that people see is that, you know, the liquid markets are, are, are doing fine. And, you know, we've, we've experienced this over the last kind of three weeks, a pop in the crypto uh, liquid space as well. And so people are very hesitant to, um, to come forward and write, uh, uh, checks to the venture market, and it takes a lot of long-term thinking to be able to, um, to to really see the value proposition in that today. You know, when when we talk to uh, you know our LPs and prospective LPs and allocators more broadly, we're we're hearing basically two things. One is which uh, in crypto specifically, there has been this idea in you know especially 2021 when the market was moving you know up and to the right and everybody just wanted exposure. That theoretically, I can have you know five, six, seven managers just to get that exposure more broadly. And what we hear from a lot of our LPs is there's just it's not a big enough asset class today for us to have that exposure and for it to be differentiated and uncorrelated. And so we hear a lot of people say, "Listen, the stewards of capital in your space, there's probably not that many of them, and we don't need that many 
different positions or different managers. And so we still want to invest in the space. We still want exposure, but we're going to go from, you know, call it five managers down to two in the next round of funding. We're going to go and we're going to really focus on, you know, bigger checks uh, and, and just having like having a, a little bit more, being a little more thoughtful around who they actually want to back versus just getting exposure to the asset class more broadly. And the second thing that we hear is, and I think this is probably true, and you can probably talk about this uh, about venture more broadly, is the allocators themselves also need liquidity, right? So a lot of them are sitting on a lot of different fund managers. They are and haven't gotten a lot of uh, capital back to them over the last few years because of the way the markets have come down over, over that period of time. And they're sitting around and saying, I simply can't, my, my books are, are weighted too, broad, too, too highly to venture, and we can't simply put more money into venture until we still get, start getting some capital back from you know any one of our managers. And they're waiting for that. And I think the market needs to pick up a little bit and we need to start seeing exits for people to go you know, more, uh, more aggressively back into crypto uh, venture more, more specifically. But the liquid markets, we definitely see a, a little bit of a different attitude as well. I'll take the, the opposite side of what Rob and Robbie are talking about because I work on, on the liquid side. We run a, a fund of hedge fund product. I could say for sure that Going into 2020 to 2021, VC was where a lot of the action was at, where a lot of the interest was. Um, but that started to migrate mid-21. But the biggest issue that we had from a liquid perspective was obviously the events that happened with FTX scared away a lot of people. And so the lessons that we've learned since then, so let's say a year forward from uh, what happened last year in 22 to current day in 23, is that we have a lot of our investors, big institutional investors, such as allocators like pensions, endowments, sovereign wealth funds, all asking us not only to conduct the due diligence that you would also see on the VC side with the managers that, that we work with, but more importantly, uh, considering things such as counterparty risk, not just for our portfolio, but drilling down to each of the managers that we work with to ensure that, again, that they have the proper checks in place with regard to not only monitoring counterparties, but more importantly, being able to move around the liquidity spectrum based on the strategy that they have. And to be honest with you, it's not an easy feat. You know, there's only a few counterparties that are out there that can really execute on the various strategies on the liquid side, in particular, when you consider a strategy such as market neutral or quantitative strategies. Um, a lot of people like to hedge through um, various types of derivative instruments. And the issue that you have there, which is more a global issue, and I'm sure we'll talk about this later, is that if you're one of these crypto hedge fund managers trying to execute, again, one of these complex trades, you're almost forced to do it with an offshore counterparty, which again, presents risk and scares away some institutional investors where, let's say here in the US, your US-based counterparties, Coinbase being the prime example, is not able to fully execute the strategy. So that's a balancing act that we have too, that again, to Rob and Robbie's point, people are interested in liquidity, but they're not able to really fulfill the, the requirements that they have uh, in and of themselves, because they're afraid of having blowups like we've had over the past year. Yeah, maybe. And, and Luca, we sit more on the other side where we're, we're supporting funds. Typically, we do see information sometimes a bit earlier in industries and how the industry is reacting because it, it generates leads or, or sales for us. And we support about 30 fund administrators and, and several hundred um, spot crypto funds. Um, and we are it, it definitely dried up. I think everyone that everyone was saying at the beginning of the year um, is, is true. We are starting to see a, a little bit of movement there, right? Obviously, and, and I don't mean just because of the bump in the last week, but even before that, we were starting to see a little bit more capital, trin capital trickle down and then be deployed. And uh, But it was in smaller amounts. Uh, naturally, everybody's looking for a discount in the steel right now, um, whether it's VC or in liquid markets. And um, but we are seeing uh, it looks like a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel for what it's worth. I'm hoping for it to last, but to give a, 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 a bit of a positive remark to all that. Yeah, I think the um, just sentiment more, more broadly has gotten considerably better over the last I don't know, two months or so, um, especially since the XRP ruling and since we've gotten more clarity around uh, Bitcoin ETFs. The institutional allocators, to your point, you know, all the big guys, the pensions, et cetera. Um, definitely better conversations since then, since August or so. Great. Uh, I want to touch on this uh, flight to quality topic. So we have seen strong performance in Bitcoin year to date. I think it's like 100%. Smart contract platforms are maybe 50% up. And then 
selective group of DeFi tokens have done relatively well. To your point, there is a strong performance in some of the more liquid aspects as well as kind of flight to quality concept, right? What does that mean in terms of the uh, overall space? Uh, how should you think about that? Because you, you can you can relate this to traditional markets too, that uh, liquid markets tend to lead in terms of some of the expectations or repricing, right? So I'm just wondering how you're thinking in terms of uh, on some of the products that you are managing, whether it's uh, private funds or valuations of some of the protocols, right? Uh, are we kind of done with uh, devaluing the, or the repricing on the private side? Or uh, are we thinking there is more, more to be done there? And then um, just in terms of uh, understanding that uh, sort of liquid versus not li liquid sort of component, uh, how should we think about valuations in general? In the space, yeah, maybe I can start on the private side, and then other people have better perspectives on the the public side. But on the private side, uh, I think we actually bottomed in Q two uh, when it comes to valuations. So if you look at the secondary markets, um, th those valuations have come down a little bit more into Q three. We're talking, you know, the crypto unicorns, decacorns that raised at you know multiples that made absolutely no sense relative to public markets. You know, eighty, hundred times uh, ARR type type multiples. And those businesses are all you know, trading in secondary markets at 70, 80% discounts now. And they've some of them have actually grown into that valuation. And, and so we've seen that right sizing. But when it comes to things like seed deals, series A deals, we probably had that repricing a little bit quicker because so many funds were sitting out earlier in the year. They didn't want to invest. They were concerned about you know allocating too quickly. They were concerned about where the market was going. And they were hearing from their LPs to, to sit and wait and see what happens. And so people were sitting out, you know, into Q2. As we got, you know, that better sentiment into early Q3, uh, we started to see a lot more capital re-enter the space. We started started to see deals get a little bit more competitive, and the pricing has probably gone up a little bit at that earliest of stages. I think the mid stage, so called Series B, C, still basically dead because the reality being, there's only a few crypto funds who do that stage right now. Uh, it's you know, injuries in us, a few others. Um, but the traditional guys who were maybe, you know, kind of crossover funds or were, you know, a little bit of tourists, they're, none of them have come back yet. And, you know, they, as they tend to do, will probably come back uh, when they, it, the, it's de-risked and some of the rest of us have, you know, already allocated and when valuations are high again. Can I just, just follow up question that if you kind of think about uh, last couple of years, they have used token as a mechanism to raise capital essentially. Do you think that sort of tokenization aspect that is a protocol sort of launches a token and then you use that to raise the capital? Do you think that's sort of game over or do you think there is still a, a use case to use the token to essentially uh, decentralize the protocol and raise the capital? Or do you think that's just a function of the regulatory environment that we're in? Yeah, it's definitely contextual, right? So there are protocols and businesses and applications where having a token is the right mechanism for how they are supposed to raise capital. And there are ones for which in the past couple of years have issued tokens and it makes absolutely no sense. There's no real reason for them to exist, right? And what we've seen is, at least in the US, people are trying to figure out, you know, what is the right way to raise capital? What is the right way to, uh, they may even decide to raise capital into an equity business, but still have a token to decentralize over time. Etc. And they're trying to bridge that gap between, you know, what is a hostile SEC and regulatory environment in the U.S. today versus what is the right thing for the open source software that the people are building right now. Um, and so, you know, the, we've seen things like Uniswap Labs, where of course, you know, they issued a token and raised a token uh, uh, originally, and then they raised a large round into the equity recently, and now they are, you know, uh, there's value accrual at their front end and it's real revenue. But so, what do, what happens to the token? Is it orphaned, etc.? And I think a lot of these guys are trying to figure out, you know, how do we bridge that gap? And the pendulum swung this year all the way over to the equity side. And now we're seeing it starting to swing back where people are figuring out, you know, what, what's the right place to be in the middle? And it's something we're still figuring out as an industry. Yeah, I think you have to, it's hard to be creative right now. And, and, um, and you, need, you need revenue. It's, it's that simple in order to appease investors in any way. And their requirements just went up. Um, audits obviously are, are forefront. However, in this industry, it's impossible to get an auditor if you don't already have one that's that's big. Um, I spend a lot of time helping even 
VC funds and other ones trying to find auditors because we service a lot of auditors and it's really, really challenging um, because none of them want to accept them because of their own risk committees, which is a bit ironic. They're, they're supposed to be the, the ones that are uh, meant to, to help businesses be mature, in my opinion. So I think if you're an auditor, you should be accepting clients in the crypto industry. Um, and, um, and there's a number of other circumstances like that that are making it very difficult for businesses to operate, which then is making it difficult for investors to invest. However, we're seeing a lot of um, things that we don't control, like the Bitcoin halving, um, uh, the S1 filings, kind of, I'll put those in the middle, but obviously everybody's looking forward to those. Um, and there's a lot of other, and if you go to, I mean, I could, I could list countless countries around the world, Hong Kong, Brazil, uh, Liechtenstein, Switzerland, Germany, UK. Um, there are so many traditional businesses right now that are requesting some type of a digital asset license to do something unique that's all planned to launch in the first half of next year. Um, I think all that momentum will will finally work its way back to to something that investors can invest in um, and uh, and create a lot more momentum so I think it's it's the right now it's the time to work investing or fundraising is is really hard but hopefully it's going to be corrected here by q1 q2 Go ahead, Rob. Oh, I was going to circle back on the flight to quality uh, discussion a little bit and just tweak it a little bit. So I'd say it's a flight to quality and also a thirst for information. Uh, what we have seen is a lot of investors are flocking to those quality venture funds, uh, quality name brands like, you know, Rob had mentioned, uh, people want to decrease their number of relationships to a couple quality uh, managers, but they're also asking more questions. And they're not just playing into the FOMO of, okay, this is, you know, the first close is happening in a month, like, let's, let, let's just uh, write a check and get in. They're asking real questions on diligence. They're asking real questions on use case and and why an, uh, a fund is um, investing in what it is. And we hear this question a lot of uh, what are the actual exit potentials? Like, you know, you've raised a few venture funds. Uh, you, you have a little bit of DPI, but most of your returns are paper, like what is the actual exit potential? So I'd say that while people are flocking to quality, um, quality funds, they're also taking it a step further and asking more questions, uh, which is very healthy to see, I think. And, uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a natural part of the cycle. People should be asking questions. People should be demanding more from the, from the partners that they have in the, um, in the space. So there were a few subtopics here I want to address three. The one is valuation. The other, Ivan, as you had mentioned, is uh, altcoins, what's happening there. And then I want to address the, the comment about service providers, or specifically auditors. So we have a liquid investments in our portfolio, uh, essentially venture style investments. Uh, because we are a liquid fund, we have to value our portfolio much more frequently than your typical VC or even private equity funds. And so that's taught us a bit of a lesson over the past few months. And that first and foremost, we've had to go hire a third party valuation agent to help us value this stuff. And the other reality, which is, I think, common knowledge amongst most of us, but just to state out loud, is when it comes to crypto investments, not necessarily getting something that you could value such as cash flow. So you have to consider things such as comparables or, again, the value of tokens or underlying assets. And I will tell you, that's been a challenge for the valuation agents that we've engaged with. Uh, we interviewed a bunch of them. We, we obviously made a decision on one of them just because we felt that they probably had the best sense as to how to properly fair value an investment. But the reality is, is that everything's being discounted. And so to the point that Rob made too, that has to kind of get flushed out over the next few months and the next year to kind of stabilize to make private investments, liquid investments uh, actionable and interesting. Now, for the point uh, about altcoins, and I want to use a phrase that Robbie had just used, which is flight to quality. That's been an issue on the liquid side because a lot of altcoins, although some have done well, have not done great. And the main user issue there is when you create a line of demarcation between CFI and DeFi. Most altcoins trade DeFi. And again, from the perspective of an institutional investor or working with other institutional investors, they have very little tolerance for investing in either directly on their own or through a manager, investing in DeFi because they're just afraid of all the 
regulatory things that could happen to them or the regulatory implications of investing in these things. Uh, they're afraid of common technological security issues such as hacking. And so, again, that's forced a lot of liquid crypto managers, hedge fund managers specifically, to, again, limit their strategy, which really hasn't shown the potential of what they're capable of because of this notion that there's just this immediate fear of investing in, in altcoins or specifically DeFi altcoins. And more specifically, back to the regulatory issue, as long as there remains uncertainty, at least here in the U.S., particularly with the SEC or even the CFTC, as long as there remains uncertainty, then people are going to be forced to trade with certain counterparties. And again, if you go with a regulated counterparty, they can only trade certain types of crypto assets, and that puts limitations on the strategy. Now, for the last point that was brought up with regard to auditors, this has been a very big point of focus for us. We've seen a lot of managers, both VC and, and liquid hedge funds, uh, have their auditors walk away from the engagement, which is obviously a very, very bad sign. Uh, it's not necessarily that there's something nefarious going on in the manager's operations. It's just the issue that, to the point that was raised earlier, there's not a lot of experience in the audit field with regard to auditing crypto. Um, there are, I would say, maybe one or two of the big four that seem to, uh, or at least give the appearance of being much more experienced there. But there's a whole another level of, let's say, tier two auditors uh, that have tried to get into the space, but very quickly realized that they were in over their heads and had to walk away from engagement. So that, too, is going to be a hindrance, at least for the foreseeable future, before we start getting some real capital in the air in order to, again, uh, give justification to the audits and give people a comfort level that they require. Yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, I would say that, you know, altcoins, a few things there, like just valuation itself, it's very hard to do, right? I mean, you can come up with a methodology, but it's, it's just there's so many ways you can value some of these DeFi protocols. Some of them, we don't really know what to make of them. Like, they, for instance, Uniswap, it's a governance token. Just can do governance, right? But it's valued $5 billion. What's the market cap right now? So uh, I personally don't know what that all means. So at some point, that's going to be... It's going to be, have to be flushed out in terms of what are the criterias, what are the sort of valuation methods, what are the value accruals, and just the regulatory clarity. Um, thanks for that. So kind of globally thinking about what you're seeing, uh, we don't want to be like very U.S. centric. What are things that you're seeing globally, uh, whether it's Asia or Latin America, Europe? Uh, obviously, we had some regulatory developments in uh, uh, Emirates. You had regulatory framework in Europe, right? How, how are you seeing the global picture? Are you seeing some dispersion between what uh, institutional investors are looking here versus what they're looking in Asia or Latin America? Can you comment to that briefly? Sure, yeah. And I've, I've been to, <clears throat> visited quite a few of them in person this year, about probably about 20, 25 countries. And the, uh, and the I, I mean, it's, it's very different than talking to U.S. regulators to start. Um, but not all the the U.S. regulators are, are anti-crypto, just the, the ones that are, of course, are all over the press. There's, there's quite a few that we see frequently that are lobbying internally, and, and, um, and it seems like things might be going in the right direction there a little bit too slowly. But uh, to your question, Hong Kong and Brazil, I kind of put in a, in a similar um, stage right now where they've, they've got frameworks out, they're gathering comments, they're trying to figure out a way to regulate tokenized assets, and they're doing that very broadly. So it's beyond just the traditional crypto, which I guess is a term now. Um, and um, and they're, they're trying to figure out how to tokenize CBDCs, uh, tokenize traditional assets, and then traditional crypto are really the three big categories. And, um, and it's a lot of positive conversations that I'm seeing. And, uh, and supporting businesses towards that launch date that I mentioned around the Q1 generally. Um, we're in Switzerland, Germany, Liechtenstein, you already have frameworks that are out. There's some of the oldest frameworks in the UK. Um, and, uh, and so I think that you're, you're definitely seeing a tailwind of a lot of businesses that are following that right now. Not all of them have announced, but pretty much all of the banks. I haven't spoken to a bank in any of those countries, and I've spoken to probably over 100 of them that doesn't have a tokenized asset project underway right now with a launch date somewhere in the first half of next year. So, and then the regulators are, are part of those conversations and in, in receiving it. So I kind of put them in those two categories. You have a framework or you're developing one right now, and then they're probably a good six months or a year behind the others. Yeah. Do you think that some of the frameworks that we have seen like uh, in Europe, right, uh, as well as Emirates, do you think they are complete? 
No, there's not a single one I think that's complete. I think that's a safe comment. But they're moving in the right direction and they're, they're, the intentions are appropriate. But that's where the industry needs to, to interact with them and, and help tweak them. I mean, the infrastructure bill in the United States, I think it's been pointed out on several panels here, how many holes there are in it and how many things need to change. There is a little bit of time to change it. Um, and, uh, and I think it's the same thing with a lot of the other ones. So they vary. They all have strengths and weaknesses. But, but they're not banning crypto. They're not, you know, they're not doing extreme things for the most part. It, maybe I'll take it from a different perspective because I think all oh, that's right on the regulator side. But when I think about it from an investment perspective and the, and the capital allocators, what we see is kind of very distinct themes in the different regions. And we consider ourselves probably the most global of the crypto funds uh, with uh, about 35% of our portfolio in the, the Asian region. Um, and, and what we see is, is a few things. In the US, it's still very specifically focused on things like institutional access and you know, trading infrastructure. A lot of people who have come out of you know, large asset managers, large trading firms, et cetera. A little bit of gaming here as well because of the, um, um, the, the large gaming shops and some you know, kind of layer one, layer two evolution because of people falling out of Google and, and Apple in these places. But it's really, really around uh, institutional level infrastructure and you know, access, right? To your point about in what we see in Europe is almost everyone is focused on tokenization of assets there. So that happening here as well. But if you go to the you know the panels uh, that are really focused on that here, you you hear Citi or JP Morgan or whoever say, hey, listen, we're going to do tokenization of assets, but it's going to be within our private, permissioned, uh, completely controlled you know blockchain that sits completely out of any other network. Which to me just sounds like a database, and I don't know why we're calling you know even building on blockchain because by the way Ethereum is not a very good blockchain or it's not a very good um, database, right? It is a, has specific types of of reasons for it to exist. That if it's just a private uh, database, it is not actually fulfilling that, and it is not actually better than what you could do otherwise. And so um, those kind of projects are really just accruing value to you know the banks themselves and and you know reducing some back office costs. But there's no kind of value accrual to the broader ecosystem, right? In Europe, people are saying, well, how can I you know, do an on-chain bond issuance? But can I have that interact with blockchains more broadly and with protocols more broadly in a way that br- brings composability and trans- uh, 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 primarily composability, but also just coordination of, of different types of, of counterparties on public chain, right? And that is, is something that's really the big focus in Europe. And then in, in Asia, honestly, it's very much around consumer applications because we're seeing you know so many people have NetEase and Tencent in these places. And in Asia, the consumer behavior is really around uh, you know kind of gambling and gaming and uh, trading are really kind of considered the same things. And you see you know the company men going home at you know whatever 11 p.m. at night. And they're you know trading some sort of like exotic derivative on their phone on on the train at 11 p.m. That is something that has existed there for a while, and naturally you know kind of lends itself to being part of a crypto or gaming ecosystem. You stifle innovation a lot when you um, when you have this overreaching regulation, and I think the U.S. is really um, it's it's really going to fall uh, pretty far behind. When, when you really think about how much they're trying to overreach, uh, you know, Coinbase is fighting the SEC. It's a great fight. And I, I, I mean, I do, I do believe that they, they will come out ahead. Uh, but if you put too many rules in place, you're never going to have that pure innovation. It's going to go elsewhere. It's going to go to the places that really um, value uh, development. And so our portfolio actually is um, kind of similar to Rob's portfolio. It's a global diversified uh, portfolio. So we've invested in 10 funds. Those cover uh, many different countries and we have Asia exposure as well. And we see those companies there kind of just being a little bit more active. Even in Europe, uh, our companies are a little bit more active. They're willing to go a little bit further. And uh, it's in the U.S., I, I mean, we, we, it's the U.S. We'll always have innovation here. But it is, um, it is disheartening to see how much people are waiting for regulation to be the unlock 
for institutional capital to come in instead of just waiting for um, or, or just allowing innovation to, to really grow and then people being attracted to the technology. Uh, so I don't know. It's uh, it's a it's a tough spot to be in uh, while regulation is important. It's like a catch 22. It It's going to hinder development. Yeah, that's interesting. Did you have anything to add or? Yeah, I, I uh, I'll, I'll come up with a phrase right now. It's regulation drives globalization as far as I'm concerned. So, so what do I mean by that? Well, for, again, outside the U.S., the regulators are being proactive. Now, it's different in every market. If we look at Europe, for example, one particular regulator, the UK FCA, they've been proactive in so far as at least allowing the ability to trade certain crypto and also specifically derivatives. But more importantly, to help develop that market there, again, in terms of, of really the liquid managers. In Asia, and specifically in Hong Kong, I think Rob brings up a good point that it's more a retail type of market versus institutional. At least that's what I've been hearing and seeing for the most part. And the fact that um, the Asian institutions and in mainland China and Hong Kong are a bit reticent to get involved just because of oversight of the government, where, again, it's, it's the retail investor that's driving that. Where in the Middle East, it's something altogether different. The Middle East is doing, I think, two things that are very proactive and very good. They're driving the infrastructure to their geographic regions or to their countries, meaning that if you're going to open up uh, any kind of uh, crypto business in the Middle East, they're essentially demanding through rules and regulation that you have the infrastructure, the servers, and all the other kind of hardware and software there being driven out of their data centers, which forces the market to be de developed there. And the other matter that you have there, too, is, again, if you're going to set up as an investment manager, they want you to set up an office there. So each one has a different perspective. But again, the main point is that that these three regions, um, again, are being proactive through regulation versus reactive and almost a hindrance as to what we're seeing here in the U.S. Right. Yeah, I was just to add to your point on the U.S., I would say in general, um, clearly U.S. seems to be lagging what's going on in the world. But I would say at the same time. Uh, some of the recent cases that we have seen and how they're developing, I think they're sort of building the backbone of maybe interesting uh, institutional framework that we could see in U.S., right? So, like, for instance, uh, the Ripple case was focused on distribution mechanism, right? One of the focuses was on the distribution of the token. And then, so I think uh, the U.S. is kind of slow, but maybe, maybe American, as they say, Americans tend to do the right thing in the end of the day. So we'll see how that goes. The second aspect is that uh, it's not very surprising that, uh, at least to me, given that I came from traditional finance, that we see so much uh, restrictions and enforcement by U.S. authorities, right? Because if you look at U.S. financial system, it is one of the most regulated system on earth, right? When you're talking about banking, when you're talking about investment management. So I don't know why that comes as a, such a surprise to lots of uh, crypto-native individuals. And I also work for a crypto-native company. But... Uh, I think it should be done like that, right? You need a framework, you need a very deep framework, you need investment protection, right? And you need to make it very clear what's security, what's not security. And also there are some cases where it's not very clear uh, whether it's security enough. For instance, you can have a project start very centralized and it can decentralize over time. There is no legal framework to do that right now. So I would say uh, US is lagging, but uh, these are really deep questions that you cannot solve very quickly. Uh, I, th at least that's my opinion. Can I counter you yep. a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I think in the U.S., absolutely. Regulation is good, but there isn't, is, is the, the problem at its core. And there's just litigation. And we've got very draft frameworks that just were released long after all this litigation started. And so it's just backwards and it's incredibly political and, and it's not productive. And going into our now presidential election is, is uh, only going to add to more uncertainty. Um, so I think you go to other countries, I don't hear politics brought up at all when it comes to digital asset regulation. It's not a, and, and whether it's going on there more acutely and we're not seeing it as, you know, looking from the outside in, but in the U S I mean, it's, it's front and center. And I think that's at the core of, of part of the problem, uh, with it here. I don't have the solution to that necessarily, but other than fixing politics. Yeah. And I, I think like. One of the things that you hear Gary Gensler continue to say is we have an existing framework and people just need to come in and comply. And you don't hear anyone say that in any other country anywhere else in the world. And it is either so that Gary Gensler is just smarter than everybody else, or it's a non-serious point that is hiding the fact 
that it is about politics. It is about, you know, personal interest. It is about, you know, maybe just trying to drive uh, the market, you know, uh, outside of the U.S., which, of course, I think we all believe is a mistake, right? Uh, but those the, that type of conversation, when we have that engagement at the top or what you see them, or the way that they, they pitch this, you know, when, you know, they do these YouTube videos or whatever, that is something that is so out of step with what is happening everywhere else in the world. Now, you can talk to the staffers on the Hill. You can talk to, you know, the... Um, the, the middle, uh, the people who are actually working every day at the SEC, a lot of people are actually really thoughtful and they want to engage. They want to figure out a framework that works, but they feel hamstrung by what is happening at the top. And to your point, it is almost surely because of politics. One other point I, I want to make under the topic of globalization, and this is a personal view, but I think an important one, aside from regulation, aside from politics, is just something else that's really important that's driving um, capital flows globally versus here in the U.S. And that is the consultants. I've worked at one of the consultants, and one of the big issue, issues I see, again, from an institutional capital perspective, is that globally, predominantly in Europe and in the APAC region, using Australia as an example, there's not necessarily a consultant sitting in front of a big institutional investor like a pension or superannuation or a sovereign wealth fund. Where in the U.S., there's always a consultant, or most times there's a consultant sitting in front of them, and the consultants have not yet gotten there in terms of being able to have a large enough appetite of risk when it comes to crypto. And so they've also been an influencer or factor on, I would say, preventing institutional investors from putting capital into, into the crypto industry at large. And so that's something else that I see as a differentiator between what's happening globally and what's happening here in the U.S., I'll just uh, add quickly. Today, this even this morning, I read that the SEC is having trouble hiring blockchain crypto experts. How can you have the people who don't understand the technology or don't understand what this could be drafting 200 pages, 300 pages, 1,000 pages of regulation? Um, it's, it, you know, the incentives are perverse. Like it just doesn't make sense. So until people can catch up or be willing to listen in a non-political way, um, you're going to have stifling re regulation. Yeah. All right. So innovations. Uh, what do we make of recent innovations that we have seen in uh, scaling blockchain? So in Ethereum, we have seen Rollups and Ethereum. That's it, personally, I believe in that thesis. I think that you're going to see uh, one major chain and potentially rollups. So that's like one modular school of thought, right? How you can scale the blockchain. Uh, so we have seen this in activity when it comes to Ethereum rollups, uh, including my company. We launched the rollup solution recently. It looks very promising, although the transactions per second it's still, you know, maybe it's like a multiples of Ethereum, but it's not where it needs to be. What do you? What's your thesis in terms of scalability and some of the innovations that you're seeing, and how do you see that uh, unfolding eventually? Yeah, and I can start since I'm uh, and, and I'm the one who runs the private fund. Um, but listen, I think the the conversation around Ethereum scaling has been happening for a long time, and uh, in 2021 that came to a head because people were having a hard time transacting on ETH Layer One, in part because there was a lot of retail speculation, there was you know, NFT trading, you know, et cetera, right? And so gas fees were such that you were paying a really high fee per transaction that didn't make any sense for an institution. Right now, what we're seeing is that actually the vast majority of transactions are still happening on ETH Layer 1, even among the more complex uh, applications. So, um, you know, the, the about 70% of DeFi trading today is still done on Uniswap. 60% of that is on Uniswap on ETH Layer 1, um, in, uh, Arbitrum being the other, uh, the, uh, the, the Layer 2 that gets the, most of the rest of the, the volume. Most of the NFT tr uh, trading is done on ETH Layer 1 through Blur. I actually saw that yesterday was the first day Blur ever had more uh, traders than, than OpenSea. Um, and so it hasn't necessarily been a, it's been, well, it's been part of the conversation it hasn't been something that has necessarily um, come to a head in terms of usership or applications. And what we've seen is the um, all of the, the 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 large institutions are doing something on chain. People don't know this, but um, uh, I think it's Pitney Bowes who's doing like a, a, an absurd amount of transactions every day on Hedera. Uh, nobody else has any nothing else has happened on Hedera whatsoever. But they basically tailor picked Hedera to say, "Hey, we're going to do our you know supply chain tracking on Hedera." Um, we've seen the same thing happen with some of these private chains that we talked about earlier. 
And so the institutions at least have seen that like we can't be on ETH layer one, even though that's where a lot of the liquidity is, a lot of where the application volume is, et cetera. And so the the point being is that like what is going to be the winning scaling solution uh, is really still um, you know kind of up for grabs because nobody is actually using any of them today in any real way, right? So we um, you know we're an investor in optimism uh, and we are kind of a firm believer and you know their super chain thesis and how you connect on a layer a layer two roll up and through uh, through their optimistic roll up um, across the the you know the different ecosystems. Um, but there are, we're also a big investor in a, a zero knowledge proof uh, roll up called uh, Matter Labs, which is uh, ZK Sync era. And so, you know, we are trying to figure out where we think the best tech is across maybe some of the different theses. Um, but which thesis is actually going to play out and which one is going to win is still very much uh, up for grabs. Final thoughts. We, we're kind of running off time. But... Yeah, maybe just to, to add to that, I think that we're seeing a lot more practical use cases now. And I think the, they're understood better. We've seen a lot of the traditional industry go to the crypto industry and then go back to the traditional industry now, um, just due to turnover and economic conditions. So you've got a lot more experience in traditional companies now that, that actually know the topics. So I hear use cases that make sense. I think going forward, when we do see failures, because of course there always will be them, they will be more execution failures and they won't be the, the technology or, or, or missed use cases. Um, and um, so I am looking forward to all of this going forward um, as compared to 2018, let's say, I think uh, most of the conversations that I'd have, uh, the use cases just didn't even make sense and they weren't realistic. So, uh, you know, we have, we have now come a full cycle from, from when that was the case. Just based on our data, so we are investors in 10 venture funds. Uh, we actively track about 40 funds. Just based on the data, people are focused on tokenization of real world, real world assets. That's where we, we're seeing people writing checks into and then also what they're talking about. So that's, that's what innovation I think is coming. For me, whatever the utility is of any particular chain, I think the most important thing that we need to figure out how to reconcile is, the, is what's going on between the, the requirements of AML and KYC versus you know, things such as zero knowledge proof or being able to hide one's identity. Um, we're not going to go very far until these things are reconciled or some kind of solution is kind of threaded through the needle on that one. So that's the big one for me. Well, thank you all. Interesting discussion, different perspectives, but I appreciate it. And uh, thanks.